Hello, everybody. Welcome to SCAD Radio, More Than Music. This is your production director, Megan, and we are here with some of the production cast of Armageddon Time. Thank you guys so much for being here. For the people, could you introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Scott Morris. I'm uh, the editor of the film. Christopher Spellman, a uh, composer. My name is Happy Massey, and I'm the production designer. Thank you so much. So I would like to kind of go down the line. Uh, so first, for Happy, um, as the production designer for a period piece, um, were there any parts of the production or like set pieces that you had a hard time nailing down? Um, do you want me to hold this? Sure. Okay. Um, I don't think we didn't have anything specifically that was you know hard to nail down because. You know, I lived in New York in the 80s, and so it was sort of first, you know, first hand for me. The thing that was hard to nail down was finding the right location to do James's house. Um, you know, and so we visited many houses before the, we picked the one that we ultimately chose. Um, but I, there wasn't anything that was specifically, you know, challenging except for, you know, sort of recreating New York in the 80s in 2022. You know. I would imagine that for, for some of those things, like the big street shots where you have to have all of those cars on the street and all of that, is, do you have to like shut down entire streets and kind of renovate them on the scene? Um, traditionally, yes. <laughs> but in this case, all those cars is actually about four or five cars. Yeah. Yeah. But it's shot in a way that, I mean, I was even look. I was the first time I saw the movie, I, movie, I was actually surprised how it feels like a much bigger movie yeah. than than it actually was, especially, especially those scenes, the exterior sh scenes. Um, so, and then we did a street in, in Queens where we sort of rebuilt the movie theater and we did a couple shops, but that was actually probably the most challenging scene or night shoot that we did because we had access to several stores, but not all of them. Yeah. So it was sort of like a patchwork of things that were period and then things that we were going to have to generate in, in, in post. Yeah. And so we sort of had to cut around it. We didn't get the scale and the scope that we wanted, but we did the best we could. What can you do? Yeah. Got the marquee. Got, yeah. got the marquee. And I'm sure as an editor with those patchwork shots, it must have been a little bit tricky to get them all to flow, right? Uh, no, we worked around it. You know, we worked with what we had and we used VFX to enhance, mm -hmm. you know, so... The shop fronts became the liquor store that James actually found the liquor store. That was the actual liquor store as reference. We found the picture. Oh <laughs> um, it's a lot of that, like deep yeah. research. I'm sure you know yeah. all about it. Um, did you have another? <laughs> <laughs> um, and as a last one for you, uh, for a project that's kind of fairly personal to your life with you having lived there, was there anything that you wanted to put in the film that didn't quite work for the directorial vision that you kind of had to let go of? Um, yeah, there's always, you know, like a piece of furniture. I mean, not in this particular case, not really, because, you know, it was so such a personal movie that we really tried to provide James with elements, you know, furniture, props, whatever, that, you know, were true to his childhood mm -hmm. and that would make him feel comfortable walking on set. Yeah. It wasn't sort of like a period piece where you know, you're, you're free to interpret, cer interpret yeah. cer certain things, you know, we had to be very specific. So I think there were, you know, maybe wallpapers, you know, that I thought I would, were probably more interesting than others or stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's a collaboration. We're all working together and it's not about, you know, you, you can't take those things personally, you know. Mm -hmm. I know that that's a big thing in, in most disciplines in art is being able to let go of something that you love for the sake of the client. Um, I think that that's a pretty universal thing that a lot of people will be able to relate to. Um, so now for Christopher, um, the 80s are a pretty, and the 70s approaching the 80s, are a pretty in vogue time right now to be covering as far as uh, music. And they have a very distinct sonic palette um, in a lot of ways. So how did you work to give this film score a sense of originality despite the viewers like preconception of the time? Well, are you asking about the how to get the, the composed score to match with the music of the time or yeah. um, didn't even think about it? <laughs> <laughs> like, in other words, the, the, the stuff that's from the period I just, I mean, I lived in New York at the same time, though I'm somewhat older than, than James is, but, you know, but I was there yeah. while that stuff was going on, while that music, I mean, I was in college, essentially, when, when that, when those songs were out. And 
like we had a lot of fun like picking those songs and like thinking about like edits for the clash so it would work the way we wanted it to where we wanted it to work um but it, that was to establish the world outside the kids heads mm -hmm. the score was essentially at least from my point of view i was trying to establish the interiority of the student mm -hmm. of the kids so that it didn't have to be the same thing it didn't have to blend it was a it, they were in their own little world yeah. and it was it, i guess the one piece that i would say but it, it i mean it's not a period piece but like it's one actually one of my favorite things in the movie in terms of of music is i don't remember what the piece is that you guys used to have when they're running through central park uh, it was good and it worked well Right, but it became the Debussy, the uh, uh, Doctor Gratis Ad Parnasso, but, but that was like very late in the oh, thing, really the day, right? and I, I, I just knew I wasn't super satisfied, mm -hmm. and so I told James like I'm gonna try to find something else, and he's like, good luck, um, <laughs> and then I found this, and I said I, I, I can't remember if I told him like I know you're gonna love this, or I just. I didn't want to say it, but as soon as he heard it, he loved it as well. I mean, I just think it's that piece is so beautiful right there. Um, and that is, to my mind, it's like a piece of music that's both inside the kid's head, and but it can't be. They would never hear that sort of music. So to my, I, I just thought it worked as like an expression of like this this like magical happiness they yeah. find in that one instant that is somehow both inside them and outside them. Yeah. That makes total sense. There is a real sort of universality to music in that way, where you'll hear something and you've never heard it before, but it somehow feels familiar. Like, I've experienced what they're talking about. Not in this way, but I've experienced it. Um, I did also notice that a lot of the score seemed to stay pretty open and breezy. There's a lot of strings, there's a lot of keys, not a lot of really heavy percussion or anything. Right. And even in moments which are very emotionally heavy, there's sometimes uh, just a gap in the score where there's really nothing happening. So what made you choose that approach? Uh, James chose that approach. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I, I think it's clearly the right one yeah. in, in as much as, well, as I said, I mean, I, I don't really know if he was thinking of it in the same way I was, but to me, the score is what's inside them. And, you know, there's a certain delicate nature to a kid's interiority that, so, so that it just... You know, none of them are like action scenes or whatever, anything like that. It's about what each kid feels, like obviously more Paul than, than, than Johnny, but, but it's like both of them have, uh, have to have enough space so that you're, it's not them like churning away a million miles an hour. Yeah. It's them like delicately experiencing what they experience. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there there is a sort of intimacy in that that inside world that you get by just being able to look at somebody's eyes without anything around it and be able to see it. So that makes total sense. And uh, when when James kind of proposed that, let's keep it open, let's keep it kind of quiet score approach. Did you feel anything as an artist like ah oh, shot to the heart? Um, yeah, I mean I knew he was right, but it's also <laughs> like it was you know it wasn't so much the 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 style of it as the idea which he, he, I mean, he said right off the bat, like, I don't think there's gonna be that much music in the score. And I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, and he said, like, I feel, he said at the same time, which was, you know, at least half of it was just trying to make me feel better. <laughs> he's like, and that, and because there's so little music, each piece will mean more. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> except that there was more, they'd all mean more together. <laughs> but you know, it was the right decision. It was the right decision. And, and, and I, I mean, I, I do love the, the, the music that we ended up with that's not score, all the stuff you hear. The only one that I really regret that we didn't end up being able to use was that when they're walking down from the school the first day, you're hearing like Boz Skaggs, mm -hmm. but the original choice was Rod Stewart, Do You Think I'm Sexy? And oh. that, I, just, I just loved that it's like right there even better, but mm -hmm. whatever. The, the Boz Skag works great. Yeah. <laughs> That's so interesting. Um, now I'd like to talk to Scott about the editing. So were there any parts that you kind of struggled to put together or any that you particularly enjoyed putting together? 
enjoy enjoy it is easy because there's so many scenes that i loved uh one of the more fun scenes to cut was the uh that original dinner sequence so that we meet the whole family um you know you're balancing all these different characters and we wanted to make it as funny as possible you know we talked about this movie having um you know it's very heavy themes and the back half of the film gets pretty intense yeah. um yet we still try to pepper in as much comedy as mm -hmm. we could like we wanted to give it that because a child's world they are you know there's, there's absurd comedic things and then heavy drama and it's all happening kind yeah. of at once so we always tried to get all that in there um so yeah that scene was just we were able to just let loose and kind of Definitely. make it as absurd as possible which is so much fun editorially to do that kind of you're looking for these little expressions these little moments and kind of piecing it together and so that was a fun one to edit uh I mean, there's so many scenes that are just, I mean, the complete opposite spectrum is the, you know, the scene in the bathroom, which is very intense and heavy. Um, it was also really fun, I hate to use that word, you seen to edit, you know, because of just how powerful it was yeah. and, and the dynamic of the performance and being able to craft those moments and kind of let it breathe or kind of make it more, you know, mm -hmm. the, the editing work. Uh, so those those are two scenes. I mean, I could just going on like the the scene in the park with Annie Hopkins yeah. is just, oh my god, that scene was just it, it was these scenes are just incredible. That yeah, <laughs> each one of them. Um, I can I can really imagine that some of these must feel like a privilege to be able to stitch together because there's so many moments that are so intimate in somebody's psychology. So to be able to look at that raw footage and see that acting it must just be really moving to be able to look at it and be like, wow, this is in my hands now. That is a huge honor. Um, I mean, this is James's childhood. It's, yeah. These are these are real experiences, whether it's the exact moment or it's been kind of summarized or, or manipulated for the script. I mean, they're all real things that he experienced for the most part. So, yeah. And the performances are just so powerful. I mean, there were a couple of times where I would just, you know, be watching the dailies and, and, and be crying, mm -hmm. you know, and have to take yeah. a break and just kind of go for a walk because it's so heavy. Yeah. Even um, watching myself, like the, the scene in the car when the dad was giving that little monologue, I was getting really teary. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's difficult to get me to cry yeah. in a movie theater. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> That's a really yeah. powerful scene. Um, I think that editing is a pretty underrated part of the film <laughs> process. People tend to forget. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of some of the goal, I think, of editing is to be, to fall to the back and let it all breathe. But um, how would you describe your personal approach to editing? Like, are there any, any areas that you try and interject yourself into? Um, I mean, my approach actually, the short answer is everything with, with that in that case, because when I go out of scene, um, you know, I watch all the dailies, I digest it. Sometimes I'll even sleep on it and then come out the next day. And I try and edit um, without my brain. I yeah. try to edit from my heart and just kind of go in there and like almost instinctually like a dance or like if you're just riffing you know playing music but with no intention like yeah. you're just going because you know everything's in your head right you know what the mm -hmm. scene's about you know what your intention is but you, you want to let the footage tell you so I'm like first I pull my selects and I'm finding all these amazing things mm -hmm. and I'm kind of working off of that but a lot of times I want to go with the rhythm of what the footage is telling me to yeah. do and kind of exploring and I don't want to dictate I just want to feel yeah. it yeah, so definitely. my initial edits are always kind of like that just and then later on, you know, we, we spend many months analyzing the, you know, oh, should it be this line or that line? Should yeah. be this look, oh, eight frames here, whatever, you yeah. know, very specific stuff. But in the initial edit, it's just like free flow mm -hmm. expression. Yeah, I can imagine. They're in a, in a much lesser degree, um, as someone who's in the radio, I build playlists for all of my weeks of doing my music. And having that, like, I do that intuitive dance, too, where I'm just like, okay, what, what tonally do I want this playlist to be saying? And that moment when you finally get it to click all together is so <laughs> satisfying. So I can imagine on a larger scale of a full film, oh, yeah. watching it back must just be like, feel like such a payoff. You're always finding little things you want to change. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. That I relate to on an, as an artist. <laughs> mm. um, and as kind of a closing one for everybody, once again, as the radio, I'm curious, do you guys have any musical artists from that time period that you love in particular? The Clash. The Clash? Yeah. Yeah. The Clash, yeah. Cla Clash is probably a big one. Yeah. 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 And it's so perfect for the film, too. Definitely. And particularly that piece. And it was so fun because that has two recordings. Or mm -hmm. it's actually, it's the Armageddon time, uh, which is the riff of the, uh, the original reggae, reggae track. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And which is a totally different than the, you know, yeah. what the yeah. Clash did with it is so different yeah. from what yeah. it was. Um, very, we we truly experimented at one point playing the original track, and it, it was like, was whoa, this is not the movie. It was yeah. a totally different experience. 
So they, I think yeah. I think I remember. Didn't the lead singer of the Clash once say that reggae was like the future of music? I think they. I remember him talking Joe about. Joe Strummer. Yeah, I remember yeah. him talking they about. Had, yeah, they, I mean, they were so into it. Yeah. Like before yeah. it was a thing. So I mean, and I, you know, another not that we used it though. We we th talked about using it. James and I did. Kid Creole and the Co Coconuts. Oh. <laughs> um, they have great stuff from back then. Yeah. So. But. The Clash. Yeah, the Clash <laughs> the is a big one. Happy, did you listen to The Clash a lot in your I time? I saw The Clash many times when I was a kid. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How were they? They were amazing. I saw them once, and I mean, you probably don't know who this graffiti artist is, but you guys might is Futura 2000. Oh, I know that. Okay, yeah. well, Futura. <laughs> okay, great. So the first time I saw The Clash in Paris, there was a brick wall behind Topper Heaton, oh. who's the drummer of The Clash in a A-frame ladder mm -hmm. and before the band comes out this guy comes out with a box full of you know Krylon spray paints and he starts graffitiing and then he so gra graffitis throughout the whole show that's so and it's cool. Futura 2000 wow that's incredible and was he like working with the music like yeah I mean no he was just oh, I don't know if he was so working cool. specifically with the music but he would and then every night they would repaint you know the flat that and rocks. every night for the whole tour and I and I met him you know about five years ago and I I said you know you know, back in the early 80s, you know, I remember that, that concert and he totally, you know, he rem obviously remembers that he was on tour with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's not so obvious, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah, he, <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> yeah, big fan of The Clash, but I love Bus Gags, too, so I'm glad you let that. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. I, weirdly enough, generational connection, I grew up on The Clash, too, because my dad was huge into that punk scene. It was a lot of The Clash, Gang of Four, all that kind of thing. Yeah, so hearing all of that in the film, I was like, oh, I know this. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for talking with me. I appreciate it, and thank you for your great work on the film. It was a real privilege to watch.